I have but one interest here. That is to tell the truth. I don't work for anybody. No institution can fire me. They can't do what they did to Steve Jones. Uh, I, I, I'm not answerable to any person. I'm just me. I have an interest in knowing what's true. Brian Meekham suggests that I bring some of my LDS values in. Usually I don't. Usually I make it so if you're a Baptist or a Methodist or a Catholic, you can still be comfortable here. And I hope we have some non-Mormons in the audience. I understand that Utah Valley is the highest density of Mormons anywhere in the world. Is that true in the, in, you know, in the Utah County area? I believe it is. So we would probably expect a lot of Latter-day Saint people to come to an event, but I hope we have some others. Uh, I've spoken more in Baptist churches than I have in LDS churches. The Baptists in, are interested in the subject of the Constitution, and they'll invite me into their church and speak over the pulpit on the Constitution. One more memorable occasion, I was in a Baptist church in downtown Phoenix, not a very prestigious Baptist church. It was on one of the big drags in the church front, which is part of the stores. You know, you'd walk past the stores, and you'd come to one that says Baptist Church. And I was the speaker that day. It was in the middle of the week, and the, the uh, reverend was my, my master of ceremonies. He was the one conducting the meeting. And I'm standing up here preaching over the Baptist pulpit about American liberty and the Constitution, and the back door just about that far away opens up, and in the door walks Ezra Taft Benson. Now, if that wasn't an interesting experience, the minister turns and looks and sees him, and he says, oh, President Benson. He instantly knows who he is. Please come and join us. What brings you here? To now, this is right in the middle of my talk. <laughs> what brings you here today? And President Benson says, I heard there was a meeting on the Constitution, and I wanted to come see what you were doing. Would you like to speak to us? I would like that. I sat down. <laughs> I remember that was a very special occasion, and he gave a beautiful address. He told us about when he was the Secretary of Agriculture and, and when he was sent over to Russia and after the war, and it was a great message. And he told about when he was in Russia and he spoke in the Christian churches there. And how the, anyway, it was a very fitting day. And I enjoy Baptist, and I've, ever, I've enjoyed them ever since. <laughs> so I hope we got a few here tonight. We're going to talk some Mormon doctrine. It's right out of our scriptures, but it should fit anybody. It should fit any person with a decent moral character. This is from the Doctrine and Covenants. You all recognize it. And I give unto you a commandment that ye shall teach one another the doctrine of the kingdom. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the law of the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God that are expedient for you to understand. Now, this great big semicolon I added. Now, it is a semicolon, but I made it big because separated by nothing more than a semicolon, our Heavenly Father now lists the things we should teach one another diligently. They're listed specifically of things which have been. What do we call that? History. Things which are current events things which must shortly come to pass. <clears throat> Prophecy and perhaps just uh, the results of current events. Things which must shortly come to pass, things that are at home, things which are abroad, the wars and the perplexities of the nations. Don't miss tomorrow morning, approximately 11 o'clock, we will teach about wars and the perplexities of the United States, and I expect to be run out of town on a rail. That's what I expect. But nobody can fire me because I don't work for anybody. <laughs> so all you can do is boo and hiss. And we're going to talk about the wars and the perplexities of nations in the lesson called Pivotal Points in American History that Destroyed Liberty. Hmm, what could that be? You'll find out tomorrow. Uh, wars and the perplexities of nations and the judgments which are on the land and a knowledge also of countries and of kingdoms. This is our assignment. Teach one another the doctrine that he just outlined, and tonight is my privilege to address you. Now, it didn't start with me. Uh, it started with this guy right here, running this camera. <laughs> he wrote, oh, there's no person that does more diligent than Brian Meekham to teach diligently the, these concepts. He does a great job. And here's what it did for me. LatterdayConservative.com, Brian wrote an article. And the article was called, Stand with Israel, question mark. 
Now, we've heard a lot of hoopla lately about standing with Israel, a lot. The Republican candidates rave and rant about it, and Glenn Beck raves and rants about it, and I don't know, there's lots of people that think, we better stand with Israel. So I thought, well, let's read the article. I read it. I read it, and then I read everybody's commentaries. He got a lot of commentaries, some supportive and some not so supportive. They were, it was a good discussion, and I, I think that was healthy. I enjoyed reading all of the commentaries, and I thought maybe I should find out for myself what it means to stand with Israel. Now, one thing I reserve is the right to change my mind. Okay, you all ought to do that. Reserve the right to change your mind. Have a, you know, a new opinion. If you get more information and it changes what you believe to be true, maybe you should change your mind instead of just believing the old myth that you've held on to so long. Here in his article, Brian wrote, I can find no scriptural basis or modern church teachings that could be interpreted to mean that we must support Israel no matter what. And no matter what the cost, we can't afford it anyways. There is no basis at all for such meddling in the affairs of other nations, whether to prop one up or pull another down. And I thought, well, that's thought provoking. Uh, so where did I go? By the way, he's one of my young heroes, so I went to one of my old heroes a long time ago. Seems like it was in another life, half of my life ago, literally half of my life ago. I met an old professor. I met him in Lehigh, in Lehigh, Utah, in an old garage. And if you've read the 5,000-year leap, you've read the story. It's in the, the foreword to the 5,000-year leap. And in that old garage, this old hero was there. I'd never seen the old man before. He was old. He was 65. Yeah, <laughs> and I'd never seen him before, and my neighbor, Joe Ferguson, said, you here tonight, Joe? No, Joe didn't make it tonight. He turned 80 just recently, but that's no excuse. <laughs> Joe, Joe Ferguson took me to the meeting, and there in the old garage, I had this wonderful experience of learning as he shared and he taught diligently the principles of who we are and where we came from. And I thought, boy, if I'm going to learn about Israel, I better go back and reread the book that I read 25 or 30 years ago. <laughs> so I <clears throat> found that I'd given it away. Oh dear. So I went online, Amazon.com, and I bought another copy. <laughs> this all happened because of Brian prompting me to study. And I reread the book and I read it again. That makes three times. Some of you have read the book. How many have read this book? Sure. A long time ago. You've read it recently because you're not very old. <laughs> uh, I found it most fascinating to read it again. The Six Day War. Now, God works in a mysterious way. I don't think it's coincidence that my father, who died three years ago, wrote a letter. He wrote a series of letters to be put in his blog site every month for five years. Now think about that. He knew he was going to die someday, and so he started writing letters to his family. And every month, my sister posts one of those letters. And she's got a few more to go. November the 1st, the letter was the importance of our studying the story of Israel. And particularly, he says, you should read Fantastic Victory. This is his counsel to his children. And all he's got a big posterity. He lived in 97 and had 150 children and great-grandchildren. And, that, and all of these children get the chance to read Grandpa's letters long after he died. And so I read that letter the day before yesterday. I, Holy smokes, Dad! It's kind of an emotional thing to think you and I are speaking on the same subject this week. And it was close and touching to my heart, my dad's support. Study the story of Israel. And now the old man, he gave me some counsel. The night I, I was there at that old garage in Lehigh, Utah, afterwards I went up to him and I says, I don't know you and you don't know me. What do I, what do I have to do to teach for you? Oh, he says, do your homework. And a few months later, about two years actually, I, 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 was, I was employed in his service. He hired me to go out and, and lecture and to study and to research. And one day he says, what do I need to do to be a good speaker? Oh, he says, read yourself full and speak from the overflow. Oh. <laughs> so reading is the way to learn. And tonight, I started with fantastic victory, but I read for hours and hours and hours and hours. Where do you start? 
Well, I, in this case, I thought, let's Google up Jews. If we're going to learn about Israel, we're going to find out about Jews. And so I clicked a few websites, and I came to this one. The Jews run the world. Protocols of Zion. Now, have any of you read that? Good. I see four hands come up. I read it 30 years ago when I was reading myself full at that time. I read the Protocols of Zion, found it to be fraudulent and totally unacceptable. And so I rejected it. And I thought, why in the world, if their very first item on the list is the Protocols of Zion, which is a fraudulent piece of work, why would I want to read anything else that they posted? Listen to the titles. The Jews rule the world from the city of London. Power of the Jewish British Commonwealth over the world. The United States is run by the Jews who run Bush. The Federal Reserve System and the World Bank are owned by the Jews. The media is Jewish. Hollywood is Jewish. A Jewish director warns America the Catholic Church is owned and run by the Jews. Why would I want to read any of those? As you do your homework and you read yourself full, you've got to decide what to read. Well, there were 189 articles or essays in this website. And I assure you, I never read any of them. That, I, could, I could measure already not to go that direction and spend hours and hours there. So uh, I did that because I measured the first one as being fraudulent. Satan is abroad in the land and he goes forth deceiving nations. How does Satan deceive a whole nation? One person at a time. <laughs> and if he could deceive teachers preferably, oh, we can get the teachers and the leaders, if we can get, you know, media and bankers, I don't know, whoever, if anybody in, influence, in an influence situation, then we can deceive nations. I, I knew that to be a truth. I went to this book, Jewish History, Jewish Religion, The Weight of 3,000 Years by Israel Shahak in 1994. Now this is his picture. I read the reviews of his book. One, one review said, he is a rare intellectual giant. Another review said, he makes up things, fabrications, there is no foundation. And as I read his material, I think the second one probably clicked with me better than the first one. And so I didn't spend much time in the book. I didn't wade through the whole book. I went to this one, Joel Bainerman. I'd never heard of him before. Here was his statement in the little opening remark. My research and life's work have been dedicated to one goal, to help my readers understand the real problems that exist in the Middle East. Well, I was interested in that. I want to know the real problems that exist in the Middle East. And so I read further uh, to see if I could learn more from Mr. Bainerman. He had an essay titled, Were Jews and Arabs Destined to Hate Each Other? Now, he did a good job. He, by the way, grew up in Canada. He graduated in, uh, from the University in Toronto, and then he moved to Israel, and he lives in Israel today. He frequently comes to the United States to lecture. This is his theme. He lectures in universities and other places where they'll listen to this kind of a message. So I read the entire essay, Were Jews and Arabs Destined to Hate Each Other? And here are some of the things he points out. There is a third entity in the conflict in addition to the Israelis and the Arabs, the foreigners. In order of importance, the United States, Britain, China, France, and Germany. There is a third entity in this discussion between the Arabs and the Israelis, and that's the foreigners. Without them, there would be no Middle East conflict because it is the foreign influence that keeps the situation from being resolved. Now, he had my attention, and I was listening as I read along. Since the first intervention by the British in the first decade of the 20th century, the primary cause of strife is the foreign elements and their desire to control the region's natural resources. Why are we over in those countries? What are we doing there with thousands of troops spending billions and billions of dollars? What is our interest there? He still had my attention, <laughs> and I read on, and he took me to this book. Now, of making books, there is many, or there are many. I'm not sure the English, but the Bible has an Old Testament statement about books. There's lots of books, and you can read numerous books that waste your time. I'm hoping to point it out that you have to try and screen. Bainerman took us to this book, printed first in 1938, The Rape of Palestine by William Ziff, 612 pages of fine print with no pictures. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't got the book yet, but it, it, I, I judged finally I would like to read this book. 
He gave a, about a 20-page book report on it. Now, this is all on the web. You can go read it there. A 2009 reprint. Somebody felt it was good enough information, it ought to be reprinted. Uh, the Rape of Palestine is a scathing indictment of the British administration in Palestine. It is well documented. Now, this is, this is the summary statement. I went to the book report, read his entire book report. Here are a few quotes from it. High-level anti-Jewish British officials believed that the Jews would become so powerful if Britain let them that they would no longer have to accede to British demands. So they placed ob obstacle after obstacle before any attempts to settle large numbers of Jews in Palestine. Now, I already knew from other sources that this had happened. Now, he was confirming with documentation that how and when it happened. Most Arab residents of Palestine wanted nothing more than to live in peace and prosperity with the Jews, which they believed was their good fortune. Now, I'd never heard that before. The Arabs wanted to live in peace and prosperity with the Jews. The Muslim, the Muslim religious leaders, the Mufti, were openly friendly. Throughout Arabia, the chiefs were for the most part distinctly pro-Zionist. And in Palestine, the peasantry were delighted at every prospect of Jewish settlement near their villages. Commercial intercourse between Arab and Jews was constant and steady. This is different than what I'd heard before. They were friends? Yes, they were friends until 1937. But Great Britain didn't want that friendship to take place. This is what the position this book takes. In early 1919, a treaty of friendship was signed to provide for the closest possible collaboration in the development of the Arab state and the coming Jewish Commonwealth of Palestine. On March the 13th, 1919, another Arab leader, Faisal, son of Sharif, wrote, We wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. A welcome home by the Arabs to the Jews. With conscious design, I put this in red because you're supposed to get shocked here. See, uh. With conscious design, the British administration fostered hostility between Arabs and Jews. While the Arabs and Jews were trying to be friends, the British were trying to make them enemies. Contrary to what history books tell us, there was Arab opposition to British rule and a genuine desire to live in peace with the Jews even as late as 1937. Well, what's that all got to do with Joseph Smith? Well, tonight I'm going to bring in a little bit of my religious background and my religious beliefs. Joseph Smith told of an experience when he was but a youth. A messenger came to his room and spoke to him. And that messenger, he quoted the 11th chapter of Isaiah, saying that it was about to be fulfilled. This is the 11th chapter of Isaiah that was quoted that night. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. Now, Joseph was told that's about to be fulfilled. The Lord's about to come a second time, and he's going to recover the remnant of his people. He shall gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Hmm, that's about to take place. Now, I guess we can, if we're going to study things as they were and things as they are, we ought to be able to see the history, the prophecy, and then look at what's happening and see if possibly it's being fulfilled. Maybe that's happened or is happening now. On the 24th of October in 1841, Elder Orson Hyde made it to Israel. Now you think about that. The year is 1841. What method of transportation did he use to get to Israel? <laughs> it must have been very slow. <laughs> so uh, he, he finally made it there. It says it took him quite a while to get there. And he, he built an altar out on the edge of town. If you can look in the, in the background there, this is the city of Jerusalem. He built an altar and he wrote a prayer and he gave this inspiring prayer. Now it's worth reading. It's a beautiful, beautiful prophetic prayer. He blesses the Holy Land for the gathering of the Jews, the building up of Jerusalem, and the rearing of a temple. See, all of that has to happen. Stand with Israel. That's the question mark. What does that mean to stand with Israel? Now, Ezra Taft Benson is one I hold in high respect, and I have for many years. I had the privilege of speaking in a home up in Salt Lake City one night, and he was in the audience. And after the meeting, somebody comes to me and said, would you like to drive President Benson and Sister Benson home? <laughs> well, the truth is, no, I was petrified. How was I going to drive a vehicle and have a conversation at the same time? So I had this blessed experience of 30 minutes of driving while he sat there right behind me with his wife, 
with his head right over the seat talking to me. We had a great conversation. I won't dare tell you what he said, but it was good. <laughs> and he talked about things like this. Nothing in the Constitution nor in logic grants to the President of the United States or to Congress the power to influence the political life of other countries, to uplift their cultures, to bolster their economies, to feed their people, or even to defend them against their enemies. The proper function of government must be limited to a defensive role. Now, he taught that his whole life, ever, ever since I first heard what he had to say when I was having ears to hear and a heart to understand. What a great, great leader. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, the story of Israel. That was all preface. That was his introduction. We haven't even started the lesson yet. Now it's time. I'm walking across my driveway, and I look down at the gravel, and I see something catches my eye. It's about the same color as the gravel, but it caught my eye, and that's it right there. You can see it, can't you? What is that? That's a piece of a puzzle. Well, all by itself, I picked it up, and I looked at it. Oh, uh, man. You know, it made no sense at all. I couldn't, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't make anything out from that piece of puzzle. You have to have several pieces and put them together before you can start making a picture. But I went right to the toy store and I bought a puzzle. It was only a hundred piece puzzle. My sister Carolyn likes thousand piece puzzles. Is she here tonight? Right there, hello Carolyn. <laughs> But I, I, I thought, this is a way we got to, we've got to understand how we learn. Line upon line, bit upon bit, piece by piece of the puzzle, we put it together. And pretty soon, hopefully, you start to see the picture. Can you see it now? Not completely, but it's coming together. It's coming. And eventually, if you study hard enough and you gather all the pieces and you assemble the pieces, you'll see the whole picture. Now, I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. But I have learned one thing about Israel. Messiah will come to Israel. Jesus will return. The great Savior, the Messiah, it will happen. Republican Leadership Conference 2011, I believe this was about March of this year, it seemed to be a hot topic that day. Everybody had to stand up and say something about Israel. Michelle Bachman, I stand with Israel, America's greatest friend and ally. Herbert Herman Cain, you mess with Israel, you are messing with the United States of America. Newt Gingrich, as president, I would defend Israel against all enemies, and so forth. Each of the candidates, with the exception of Ron Paul, stood for Israel that night. He has a different viewpoint. His viewpoint, I, see, I accept, not these. Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Now we're going to take the story from Abraham to Armageddon. When I told one of my friends this, he says, that's impossible to do in one evening. We're going to do it right now with a few fun stories in between. Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. The Jewish year. As I did the studies, I came across new systems of dating. I have never used BCE and the Jewish year. I've always used the dates referred, referred to the birth of Christ. Don't That's what you use, isn't it? Don't we talk about AD and BC and before Christ? And, and uh, we reference everything to Christ. Well, not in this history that I'm reading. What does BCE stand for? Before the common era, not the Christian. This is, the, before the, this is so people that are not Christian can have a dating system that's not related to Christ. Only one thing, I couldn't find out what the common era was. I kept looking in the common era. What's the common? Well, it turns out the common era is the birth of Christ. Uh, they just didn't want to say that. But the Jewish year is dated from Adam and Eve, from the creation. This is new to me. I just learned. Thank you, Brian, for prompting me to read all this. <laughs> so the Gentile year, the Jewish year, the before the common era, all these things were dating, and uh, we'll work our way through them. Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael away. When I read that for the first time many years ago in the Bible, it made me sad. I felt badly. I really, I, I'm serious, I felt bad. Abraham, how could you do this? Well, it was Sarah. <laughs> Blame it on her. <laughs> Anyway, you've read this story. I hope, hopefully you have. Abraham had a child with his handmaid because his wife gave her to him as an as a opportunity to have a, a posterity. Sarah had a, a child. His name was Ishmael. And when Ishmael was a little older and Sarah had had her own child then, the household wasn't running in peace and harmony, so Abraham sent her away. But I was relieved to see the Heavenly Father sent an angel 
And all of these great Bible stories have numerous beautiful paintings that go with them. And it's just a joy to poke on the keys and punch and look at these images as they come up. Uh, this beautiful picture here shows the angel and uh, taking care of Hagar and Ishmael and seeing that they're not going to starve and die out in the desert. So let that part of the story set for a few moments now. We'll go back to Abraham, Sarah, and their new young'un. Canaan in the Old Testament times. Now, this land we call Israel in the earlier days was called Palestine, and then earlier than that it was called the land of Canaan. Now, the borders change a little bit. Uh, some claim, you know, some Bible scholars claim they can draw the lines by reading the text, but just exactly where the border is isn't the point here. There were three pieces, or three names for one piece of real estate. Thou shalt be the father of many nations, God said to Abraham. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Now he's got a promise. He and his posterity are going to have this land, this piece of real estate called Canaan for their possession. Now there's a spot in this piece of real estate they call Mount Moriah. Well, it just happens that the Muslims think that that's underneath the Dome of the Rock. And I was there and I looked at that rock. It wasn't too impressive and I didn't know I was on a mount. But it was interesting. And it's interesting to think that Abraham was told to go sacrifice Isaac. Take thy son and offer him as a burnt offering. So Abraham is going to be tested now and he's supposed to take his son and offer him on Mount Moriah. Well, it turns out Mount Moriah is in downtown Jerusalem today. That's, that's what they claim. Some historians say that that's where it is. Abraham, this beautiful engraving showing this moment. Abraham is going with Isaac. Isaac is carrying the wood. Abraham is carrying the fire. Now the fire was some kind of a device that they could put a hot coal in and wrap it up and keep it insulated so it didn't burn quickly. And then a few hours later they could open it up and blow on it and get the fire to come. So he's carrying the fire and Isaac says to his father, Father, we have the wood and we have the fire. But where is the sacrifice? Abraham answered, Our God will provide. I heard a father in deep sorrow, in terrible grief. Our God will provide. And then they got to the mount. This is a beautiful picture illustrating this. It's my favorite. He has Isaac ready for offer, to offer as a sacrifice. The angel of God comes and stops him. But what I like about this is the ram caught by its horns in the thicket. God provided. And Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh, meaning our Lord will provide. This is the great provider God spoken of in the Declaration of Independence when the founding fathers said in the last sentence that they would rely on the providence, God's providence. This is an exciting story. God provided. Isaac meets Rebecca, the Jewish year 2048, the Gentile year 1713 BC, or before the common era, 1713. <laughs> These datings. Twins were born, Esau and Jacob. Now we're going to follow Jacob along the line here. Jacob eventually has four wives and 12 sons and one daughter. Jacob has this experience of wrestling with an angel. It says he wrestled all night with an angel. And then toward the early morning hours, God says, Israel shall be thy name. So Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which means God rules or strives with God or a prince of God or overcomes and prevails or God's fighter. These are different names or different definitions of the word Israel. Israel, the man Jacob, the literal descendants of Jacob, the true believers in Christ, the modern name for the country called Canaan. Different ways we use the word Israel today. Israel and his family went down to Egypt in the Jewish year and the Gentile year. It's a long time ago. The Jewish year and the Gentile year, the Israelites leave in a mass exodus from Egypt. And again, these beautiful paintings that uh, represent the parting of the sea and so forth. The Jewish year, 2,488, the Israelites enter Canaan. 
Now Canaan, we're back here to this land, this piece of real estate that we're talking about tonight, and they divided this land up. So we see these tribes get different pieces of real estate. Here the tribes are. There are 12 of them. Now they had a system of government called the judges. And they were displeased, the people were. They didn't like the system. It was God's system. He'd given it to them. He'd established it. And they said, oh, but we want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. And so they prevailed upon Samuel, and Samuel went to God, and God said, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They rejected me. Okay, warn them what will happen, but we'll give them a king if they want one. And so they got King Saul. Hopefully you all read this story and you know it by heart, hopefully. This, this is review, but that's what we're doing. We're thinking about the country of Israel. What does it mean to stand with Israel? Who are they? Was Saul a good king? Well, for a while, not very long. <laughs> Pretty soon he was after David, trying to kill David, because David was supposed to become the next king. So David, uh, Saul finally killed himself. That was the bad ending for him. David became the king, and David named Jerusalem as the national capital. David's son Solomon reigned for a long time. He was a good king in the early part of his life. Solomon builds the temple, 997 B.C. Now this is very key to the understanding of the story today. Solomon's temple, 997 B.C. After Solomon died, there were two kingdoms, ruled over by Jeroboam and Rehoboam. The northern kingdom became known as Israel, and the southern kingdom became known as Judah. In the year 722, Assyria conquered the northern kingdom. And we have what they're called today, the ten tribes that are lost, or the lost ten tribes. We don't know exactly where they went, lots of speculation. In the year 587, the, the uh, country of Judah was conquered by, the, by Babylon, and we had the temple that they had built destroyed. Now this is a key point, because now starts the diaspora. Now I've never heard anybody say that, you know, no college professors or anything. Correct me if you'd like to say it some other way. <laughs> the Jews were dispersed. That's what it looks like, diaspora to me. See it right up here? Now the years uh, after the, after the uh, destruction of the temple, and it shows them moving here from Jerusalem over into Babylon. Well, this artist, uh, this scholar, whoever did all this uh, intricate drawing, he's trying to show how they were dispersed. And it started, what, 2,500 years B.C. or some such a number. Oh, not that much. Get the right number here. 547 B.C., that's 2,500 years ago, approximately. They started being dispersed. So we get different kinds of Jews. And you're going to see that come up in some modern books that we're going to quote here in a minute. Okay, so the first movement was off to Babylon. Now, what should we spend time reading? This woman, this woman caught my attention. Her book was interesting. We look like the enemy. Now, she comes from parents who were Babylonian Jews. That means for generations and generations and generations for 2,500 years. Her heritage was in Babylon. And so she's writing a book, and the book says, we look like the enemy. They'd been there so long, they had adopted their language, they adopted much of their culture, and she says, we look like the enemy. The hidden story of Israel's Jews from Arab lands. And then she wrote a book the next year, Not the Enemy, Israel's Jews from Arab Lands. And I haven't read this one, but the first one, yes. And uh, she's trying to make a point. This is one of her points that I thought was valuable. She names the different kinds of Jews. I used to just think, well, a Jew is a Jew. You know, if you're a Jew, you're a Jew. What, there are different kinds? Oh, there's a whole bunch of different kinds. She names some. If you can read the words as good as I can, but Bukharan, Kurdish, Mountain Persian, Ashkenazi, Babylonian, Mizrai, Sephardis, Hungarian. You've got the idea, haven't you? And more. I didn't write them all down. So there are different kinds of Jews, and guess what? Not all Jews are equal. <laughs> if you go to Israel, apparently they can recognize different Jews from different backgrounds, and they're not all given equal treatment, kind of like, kind of like the United States. Different people from different parts of the country might not be treated the same. I remember when I first came to Utah from California, I was a college teacher in Utah, and I decided to quit the profession. 
And some of my students said, Mr. Pratt, they loved me. We had a great relationship. Have you ever heard of hippies? I taught in a school where they had hippies back in the 60s. And the hippies had long hair and they smoked pot and they had other character traits that were inappropriate. But we got along just fine because they came to class on time and they did their homework. And when I was ready to move, they said, we'll help you. Well, what more could I want than a group of hippies volunteering to help me? These are my students, you know. So one of them says, do you have anybody to help drive your trucks? I was going to drive two trucks, move to Canada. My mother and father were born there. I was half Canadian. I still am. I even speak Canadian. Okay? And so we, we, we got in the truck. We started now. They, they were my students. I didn't think anything about it until I got to Utah. And we pulled into the first station in southern Utah to get gas. And the station owner attendant, he was rude and ignorant to my student. He treated him most ignorantly. And later I thought, you know, he's probably the high priest group leader. <laughs> Why did he treat him ignorantly? Because he looked different than the people in his little town in southern Utah. He had a different appearance. Well, Jews look different apparently, and they have different dialects and languages and backgrounds, and so they're not all treated equally, and I got that from reading this woman's work. These two groups have con you know, conflict. So she brings the question up, what is an Israeli? Aren't these all Israelis? She says that hasn't been quite defined yet. The second temple was constructed in 517 B.C. This is a little model. It's a very intricate model. I've seen it. I've been there. It's, it's takes up quite a large floor space and very intricate, made of Jerusalem stone, little separate segments of stone building these tiny little buildings. Okay, so the second temple was constructed in 517 BC. They used it for 500 years. Now a 500 year old building, I looked out on the plaque on this building, this building's 20 years old, it looks pretty ratty right now. In 500 years, what will it look like? Now in 500 years, uh, king Herod, the wicked, evil King Herod, he volunteered to rebuild the temple. Well, the Jews didn't trust him. Uh, they had reason not to. And so he rebuilt it portion at a time and eventually remodeled the entire structure. So the whole temple was rebuilt in 19 BC. Now, 1 BC comes. 1 BC, the meridian of time, it's called in some of the recent reading. The meridian of time. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And he was about his father's business, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. Wicked men cried, Crucify him! Crucify him! After his death and resurrection, the apostle Paul wrote, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. I'm going to correct something. I've never done this before. I have an old English teacher that keeps coming to my lectures down in St. George. And he always, after the lecture, he always says, you pronounce the word incorrectly. It's grievous. <laughs> okay, I've never done that, but I'm going to practice. I'm going to try it again. For I know this. I, I wished he were here. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Thousands of Roman soldiers surrounded Jerusalem in the year 66. It says in the reading, 40,000. And they're going to take over the city. They have a horrendous conflict. Thousands of people die on both sides. And the Jews hold them off. And so they go back and they regather and they get 60,000. And they come in in the year 70 A.D., and they destroy the city. They tear down the temple, they steal everything they can steal, they kill everybody they can kill, and they drive off the rest. Now, for all that time from then until the Six Day War, the Jews didn't have any legal right to be in that part of town. I was there. This is the only thing they didn't tear down when they destroyed the temple and the surroundings. They didn't tear down this little piece of wall. And I stood there one day and I looked at this and I remember Dr. Skousen asking the tour guide, which just happened to be his friend, a rabbi. And he says, and when will you be building the temple? 
on the site that now has the Dome of the Rock. And the old rabbi says, I don't know. That's God's problem. I remember that. I was standing right here looking at this. That's God's problem. They call this the Wailing Wall. And the people stand there saying their prayers and hoping that God will send back this, or the great Messiah will come again. Now, there are three holy spots within almost a stone's throw. You can look over the Wailing Wall at the Dome of the Rock. So we have the Wailing Wall that some people in Christianity say is the holiest site in Christianity. Now, it's not my opinion, but they hold it as a very holy spot. Why is that so? Well, we'll say a word about it in just a moment. You can see the second holy site. This is the, the second or third, depending on which book you read. The second or third holiest site in Islam is the Dome of the Rock. And then just nearby, and I pull it into the picture so you can see it, but it's not right there. I just plucked it in. You see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which some people say is the holiest site in Christianity. Now, all of these are just right there. Yeah. Okay, this is a you know, place for conflict to take place. The, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was started by Constantine the Great in the year 332 A.D., well, the one today isn't the same building because the enemies came in and tore it down once or twice, and uh, eventually it was built again. And so this is how it looks today, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, a holy site in the Christian world. The Muslims chose to build a more magnificent structure. Now, this was built in 332. So when the Muslims decided to build a more magnificent structure, and they decided to do that in the, in the year 16, 691, I believe it was, and they're going to build it over the Mount Moriah, they're going to build it right where Abraham offered Ishmael as a sacrifice. Offered who? Well, it depends on if you're an Arab or a Jew. I'm serious. The Arabs claim they offered Ishmael as a sacrifice. I came across that. Very interesting reading. The perspective they have is a little different than the Jewish or the Christian. So this is the spot where Ishmael was offered as a sacrifice, depending on which version you're going to read. The Muslims chose to build a more magnificent structure. Ooh. Isn't that magnificent? It is. That's pretty awesome. I stood there and I looked up at that. And, wow, this is something. Only one problem. No one is allowed to enter with their shoes on. No one. And we were invited to go in by the tour guide, which was my friend, Dr. Cleon Skousen. By the way, I was his assistant. That means I got to carry the suitcases. <laughs> uh, but there was a problem. I was very poor. I didn't even have enough money to buy lunch. I was, I was, all my trip was paid by my, you know, my master, the leader there. And he, he just took me along as his friend, and, and uh, I, was, I was a guest. And, and, but, but every time everybody went and bought lunch at the restaurant, I stood outside and waited. That's how poor I was. And they said, take your shoes off before you go in. So this was different. When I was there, there were hundreds of people, and there were shoes everywhere, all over the steps. <laughs> and I'm supposed to take my shoes off and leave them here? I thought I'd never see him again. Can you imagine going on the rest of the tour barefoot? But I came out, my shoes were still there. Now we're looking at the history of the Jews. The Crusades started coming down into that part of the world. Uh, were these Christians freedom-loving people with a desire to help make the world a better place? Not hardly. No, not hardly. The campaign against those who did not believe in the Christianity of the church began. So on their way from the European countries, they would go into the cities wherever there were populations of Jews and destroy whoever they could destroy before they ever made it to Jerusalem to try and recapture it from the Muslims. These are pictures, and there are many of them available, giving an illustration of what was going on in this period of time. Christians destroying the Antichrist. Well, who's the Antichrist right here? Well, this is mom and dad and their little Jewish children. They're the Antichrist, and we've got to destroy them. So we'll just tie them to a stake and burn them. This was the Christian method of destroying the Antichrist. Uh, lots and lots of various violations of Jewish uh, liberty. Here's another one. This is the Christian church against the Jewish population. This is a legend in pictorial form here from an old rare book. The theft of the picture of the Virgin Mary by a Jew. Now they propose that a Jew up here, uh, being tempted by Satan, steals the picture of the Virgin Mary, 
And one thing at a time, Satan's there leading the Jew around. They finally get the picture back. And anyway, this is to another way of persecuting Jews. And so they found all sorts of methods of doing. Here's another one. In 1347, the Black Death started spreading across the country, across, across all of Europe. Horrible thing. People dying everywhere. Oh, they said, who done it? Who was the Jews? Huh? How could they blame it on the Jews? The Jews don't drink the water from the city well. The Jews are not drinking the water from the city well. That's because they poisoned the water. And because they poisoned it, they're the ones that caused it. Kill the Jews! And so they're out again trying to kill more Jews. Well, what actually caused the Black Death? Oh, it was some time later they decided it was fleas. The rat fleas. The reason it moved around slowly was because the rats had to carry the fleas to the next ship, you know, the next port. So the rats would climb up the rope and climb down the rope, the, you know, the anchor ropes and so on, or the docking ropes, and they would take the fleas into a community. And the fleas would find their way across Europe by the rats transporting them. That's why it took so long to get across the, world, the, you know, the, the country. Millions and millions of people died. And some people were blaming it on the Jews. This was happening in 1347. This blackness shows the plague slowly creeping across Europe. More Jews were slaughtered. Martin Luther, he's a hero. Now one thing I learned as I study, there are many great heroes, both men and women, but that doesn't mean they do right all the time. Some of the great heroes do really bad things, really bad. He didn't do that bad, but he wrote some nasty things. He also wrote some good ones. I, I, I got high respect for Martin Luther. One thing I also noticed as I read, most of these gentlemen got married. And I thought, I wonder who their wives were. I wonder what kind of people they were. And I tried to find that out. And so he married this woman, Katrina von Bora, married in 1525. She had escaped from a convent. She had been a nun. He had been a, a priest. And they married and had a happy family and lived happily ever after, the best I could determine. It was a successful marriage. I think they had, somebody tell me, six children? I believe it was. Behind every good man, there's a good woman. Or behind every good woman, there's a good man. I'm not sure which way that works. The spiritual powers have not only been corrupted in sin, but absolutely destroyed. I simply say that Christianity has ceased to exist among those who should have preserved it. He made this observation as he saw the evils in the Christian church of that time. Other reformers echoed the same sentiments. These are great people of the past. Martin Luther wrote this book. Von de Newton und Ehren Lügen on the Jews and their lies. This is a notorious anti-Semitic document. <clears throat> Was it true? Do you think he wrote the truth? I don't know. I haven't read the document. I suspect it's probably a mixture, a mixture that would be about as useful as the protocols of the uh, elders of Zion, about that useful, not very useful in other words. These people are either heroes or villains, depending on whose account you read. Moses Mendelssohn, the Socrates of Berlin. Whoever wrote that thought he was a hero. He's a Socrates. He's a brilliant leader. I tend to believe that's to be true. He married from at Guggenheim. Now, when Moses was a young boy, he wasn't, his family wasn't very wealthy. And because they lacked funds, he was starving much of the time, and his body didn't form properly. And it says in the reading that he had rickets and a hump back. So he wasn't very handsome. Now, for a long time, Fromit had been told by her parents there was this wonderful friend, this wonderful man. He was the Socrates of Berlin. He was a great... And she, they, the parents told they were preparing her, you know, to meet the guy. But they never mentioned that he had a hump back. And so when... Uh, when the big day came and from it sitting there all anxious and the door opens and in walks Moses, she immediately burst into tears. <laughs> and after the situation has calmed down and the parents have left and they can sit there and talk, he says, I know why you started crying. It's because I have a hump back. She says, yes, that's the reason. They became friends, they fell in love, they married, and they had a happy relationship. From it and Moses Mendelssohn. These are, these are great figures that offered something to the future of the people of Israel today. 
Now this came as a surprise to me. I always looked at Napoleon as some kind of a bad guy. You know, he was going around stomping on countries and trying to, you know, take over the world. Well, every time he went into a city that had a Jewish population, he would befriend the Jewish population and set them free. He says, you're equal with the rest of the citizens of this city. And the Jews loved Napoleon. And so while he was in, in power, it was not uncommon for the Jewish boys to be named Napoleon Mendelssohn, or whatever the last name was. <laughs> Napoleon was, uh, here, here it says, Napoleon, uh, what it does, I can't read that, that must be French or something. Or, oh, Napoleon Bonaparte emancipating the Jews is what that uh, caption says. Jerusalem in 1857. This, this is a grist mill for grinding flour. In 1857, uh, let's just read it, the windmill was funded by the British Jewish philanthropist Moses Montefiore, who devoted his life to promoting industry, education, and health in the Holy Land. So along the path of the story of Israel were lots and lots of good people that didn't even live there. And they were helping from other parts of the world. Hundreds of millions of dollars was spent helping people in Israel from people living in other parts of the world. And I thought that's what it means to stand with Israel, is you send them support in whatever method you can. In this case, Mr. Montefiore built them grist mills to grind flour, along with other things in the mid-1800s. And he had a wife, best I could find out. Her name was Judith, and they had a positive and happy relationship. There's one that didn't have a happy one, and I didn't put his wife up there. That was John Wesley. I pulled him off the screen. I'm not going to put him up there and tell the story. You'll have to read it for yourself. <laughs> Theodore Herzl was another. Again, these are either heroes or villains, depending on whose account you're reading. I suspect he's a hero more than a villain. Theodore Herzl married Julia Noschauer in 1889. And the best we can tell, they had a good family. He was the first, he, he organized the first Zionist Congress. Now the Zionists were ones that wanted to organize and go back to Palestine and, and create a land for the Jews. And so as early as 1896, he was talking this up. Let's have a land of our own. Let's set up a place where we can call home and we're not driven relentlessly and, and killed and, and persecuted. Here, is, here he is with his family, Theodore Herzl, father of the Zionist idea. Now we have the, oh, you're going to learn about fathers in the morning. Don't miss it. Which father are you following? That's tomorrow morning's lesson. And you won't believe what you hear. Well, he was the father of something. In Israel, they looked to him as the father of the Zionist idea. And in the moment, we'll see his picture on the wall as they're pledging allegiance to their country. The Holy Land in the 19th century. Why did the Arabs want Jewish settlements near them? Remember that, what we read in our introductory material? What was it that the Jews were doing that the Arabs liked? The Jews were prosperous. They were hard-working, diligent, prospering people. They were absolutely, totally poverty-stricken, and they would come into an area that was completely desolate, filled with mosquitoes and scum, or whatever the problems were. I remember seeing one of the early films on the, the, the recovering of, of Israel, and they had huge tractors. Some of you have driven across southern Idaho. And there used to be a, a huge, huge fields of rocks about that big. And somebody had put up a clever sign. There were miles and miles of rocks about that big. And the sign said, petrified watermelons. <laughs> Take one home to your mother-in-law. That was ugly. But that's what the sign said. Well, the Jews would look at a field like that. In the 19th century, the land of Israel was nothing but swamps and wilderness, petrified watermelons everywhere. And I watched a great big tractor going in with tines on the front, picking up those petrified watermelons and hauling them over to the side and dumping them. And they'd come back and do it over and over until they found the dirt. And then they'd plow the dirt and plant it. And that's what they did to change this wilderness into a desert that blossomed like a rose. That's Israel today. What marvelous agricultural technologies they, cre they created. That and drip irrigation. Do any of you use drip irrigation? Thank the Jews for drip irrigation. They developed it. Agricultural colonization in 1822. I think they call this the first 
you pronounce that for me, Elia, 25,000 Jews to Palestine by 1902. And now these Jews are going in and buying land from the Arabs. And if you can see this, these little white patches here, this is the, the land that the, the Jews purchased. These are swamps and petrified watermelon patches, useless desert. And they're buying that. And it says that many of the Jews had never farmed in their lives. They just wanted to go to a place where they could call it home. And so they bought these patches of useless swampland and they would die from malaria the first year. And so the next generation of Jews would come in and take over the same piece of ground until they finally lived long enough to drain the swamps and kill the mosquitoes and create farmland out of these pieces of swampland. That was going on. The Arabs were getting a good price out of the ground. They were happy the Jews were there. And they continued to encourage and sell land to the Jews as these early settlers came in. Desolation and ruin, swamps and wilderness. Well, along about 1917, Lord Balfour decided they would grant the land to the Jews. Now, this is really interesting because it didn't even belong to England. Yeah. The England wrote the letter granting the land to the Jews, and they didn't even have possession of it. Who possessed the land? Turkish, Ottoman Empire were the ones that possessed the land. Well, nevertheless, in 1917, the Balfour Declaration was given, and they gave the land to the Jews. His Majesty's government view with favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Now, this is a touching story. I, I shed tears when I first read it. General Edmund Allenby, December the 10th, 1917, was commissioned by Great Britain to go in and take the land from the Turks. Now, his assignment specifically was to take Jerusalem. Oh boy, Jerusalem's been fought over for a long time. He's going to go in there and he's going to take Jerusalem. And I read on. And it said, General Edmund Allenby was a man of God. He prayed daily and read from the Bible daily. And he pled with Heavenly Father, What should I do? I don't want to go and destroy Jerusalem just to take it away from the Turks. How can I take the land without destroying it? And this came to his mind. God, he was praying, God, how can we take this city from the Turkish army and not destroy it? Isaiah chapter 31 verse 5. What does this mean, he prayed. I'm really making the story short. You're getting the short version. What does it mean? And this is what it says. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. What does this mean, God? And Allen B. decided that it meant that he would preserve Jerusalem by following this guide in the scripture. He said, I'm going to do what the scripture says. This was the battle strategy that was given to Edward Allenby. He ordered in all of the available aircraft. Now, this is the year 1917. Most of the Turkish soldiers had never seen, let alone even heard of an airplane. He ordered all of the available aircraft from Great Britain to come to, the, to come to his aid. And they flew over in formation like a flock of birds. And they dropped leaflets. And the leaflets said, in Arabic, translated to English, Surrender the city today, all it be. Well, that wasn't too awesome, except for one thing. This is where I started to cry. In Arabic, the interpreter wrote, Alabe, surrender the city today, the Son of God. And the Turkish army fled without firing a shot. I, I thought when I read that, I thought, does God really know that far in advance? Does he know that he's going to have to have a guy named Allenby be the general to take Jerusalem so they don't have to destroy it? I think he does. There are many examples where that small detail is known in advance. Allah Bey, the Son of God. David Ben-Gurion, a colorful character, with it, it says in the, in the reading material, with his faithful wife. I don't doubt that. 
They must have been quite a pair. Paula. I would say that's probably Moonweis in German. So Paula and David Ben-Gurion, and again, he's either a hero or a villain, depending on which account you're reading. He plays an important role through this time. Notice the year here is 1947. The ship, the Exodus, is sailing, bringing in 4,515 immigrants. I can't believe it. They're packed on this ship. My sister went on a cruise to Alaska once. Was it like this? <laughs> No, that wasn't quite the cruise ship style here. These immigrants included, oh, somewhere it says 615 children. And they came from Europe, and they got right down to the shores of Israel, and the British refused to let them land and sent them back to sea. Now remember, the earlier statements from Joel Bainerman, Great Britain was not really friendly in helping Israel. They did not. They did things to aggravate, irritate, and suppress the growth of Israel, including not allowing immigration. This is one example of it right here. The ship sailed back and went to two or three other ports. It was 25 days in one port, waiting, trying to get unloaded. With all these thousands of people on board, I'm sure the conditions were horrible. United Nations partitions the country in 1947. The United Nations is a horrible organization. I wish we had an hour to tell you about that. That doesn't mean they can't do some good by the evil things. That, anyway, they, the United Nations partitioned it, and they offered this idea to the Jews and the Arabs. And now the partitioning was the white would be for the Jewish state, and the brown would be for the Arab state. The Jews said, that's fine, we accept. The Arabs said, absolutely not. And now you keep a number on here. The President... Uh, Barack Obama and others of our current day want to go back to the de design earlier than 1967. Well, this is the earlier design. This is the partitioning starting in 1947. I came across this little thing here that was fascinating, worthy of repeating, and a little entertaining too. Israel's secret weapon. Before, after. Before, after. <laughs> they found, see, it, the, the, the British wouldn't allow them to import firearms. They wouldn't allow them to get ammunition. They wouldn't allow them to prepare to defend themselves. They would not permit it. And so when the, is, when the British were ready to withdraw, they had no preparation. Somebody figured out that that brass tube right there when you took the lipstick out and jerked off that little ring on the end, was this, was that right there? And they started manufacturing their own ammunition, and it says they imported three million lipstick tubes from a cosmetic supplier in England. <laughs> and then they had the shop, the manufacturing plant, in a kibbutz, that's one of their special farming communities, they had a cleaning establishment for cleaning clothing, you know, like a dry cleaner. And the upper, the upper floor of the cleaning establishment, they had all the equipment for dry cleaning. And so the British officers and the British soldiers would bring their uniforms in to be cleaned. And they would walk across the floor to the counter and they would deliver their items to be cleaned. But down underneath the entire area was the manufacturing plant for guns and ammunition. Yeah, I said it was a little over a thousand square feet. That isn't much bigger than this room, something like this. It isn't very big. Okay, before and after. That's fun history, and you can learn more about it if you Google up the History Channel. Is that credible? I actually got it from another source, so I got it from two sources. Another thing that I found exciting and interesting, how they were trying to prepare for defending themselves without any help from the British, the Turks had left behind some obsolete weaponry. They had no ammunition for it. Now this isn't actually a photograph. I'm just looking for a photograph of old cannons. And so the Jews took these obsolete cannon barrels with no ammunition. They cut them up and made them into what they called Davidka. Now Davidka was a mortar. They would put the powder and the shrapnel inside this barrel and set it off. And it says it wasn't much, it wasn't much effect to shoot anybody. It shot shrapnel, it took bolts and nuts and old nails and things in it. But what really was valuable was the noise. 
And it said it was so scary, the big bang that would take place. And it said the Arabs thought it was an atomic weapon. They would run in fear when Davidka started shooting. <laughs> These are fun bits of history that uh, have no value probably. <laughs> Haganah was the name of the Jewish defense fighters in that day and the underground preparation for independence, underground literally, underneath the cleaning establishment where the British soldiers got their uniforms cleaned, they were preparing for independence. And here they are with their weapons. They had no big guns other than Davidka. All they had was the rifles they'd smuggled in. It said they would go to foreign countries like one of them was up where the Muslims were. The, the city slipped my mind, one of the famous Muslim cities. And they would go in there and buy vegetables. But there was a big market for selling firearms. So they would buy a few firearms, bury them underneath the vegetables, and smuggle them out of that country into Israel. And eventually they would have stores of firearms, small you know, rifles. Do you remember anything about Lexington and Concord? What's the story behind Lexington and Concord? Storage of firearms. Why were the British coming to Lexington? Why were they coming? To confiscate the firearms. <laughs> Well, they didn't confiscate them all here. They didn't find them all. And the British left, and they had uh, some firearms to start the war, the war that came upon them. David Ben-Gurion, father of the nation, either a hero or a villain, depending on the, the narration you're reading. Declaration of Independence, Israel, May the 14th, 1948. This is the building they call Independence Hall today in Tel Aviv. And the people have gathered to hear the reading. Now, who's this on the wall? Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl. Remember? Theodore Herzl, the father of the Zionist movement. He was one of the early men in 1896. He organized a group in Switzerland planning to, take, uh, to make Israel the land of their future. So here's David Ben-Gurion under the picture of Theodore Herzl, and he is reading the Declaration of Independence. This is it. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here their spiritual, religious, and political identity was formed. Here they achieved independence and created a culture of national and universal significance. Here they wrote and gave the Bible to the world. We offer peace and unity to all the neighboring states and to their peoples and invite them to cooperate with the independent Jewish nation for the common good of all. The state of Israel will promote the development of the country for the benefit of all inhabitants. There were 100,000 of which were Arabs and other thousands were Christians. That's not in their declaration, but that's a fact. So there were 100,000 Arabs. And they're going to promote the development of the country for the benefit of all inhabitants. Will be based on the principles of liberty, justice, and peace as conceived by the prophets of Israel will uphold the full social and political equality of all its citizens without distinction of religion, race, or sex. Now this is, in a, it's a beautiful statement, it's a beautiful declaration. And they made this in 1940, ooh, was it seven or eight? Eight. May the 14th, 1948, they declared their independence, and at midnight, the British withdrew, not allowing them any preparation, forbidding them for any right to bear arms, no, no preparation in that manner. These people, to me, look happy. These are the Jews waving goodbye to the British, probably saying, good riddance, <laughs> get out of our lives. The Arab terrorism began immediately. Now, lots of, lots of pictures and lots of story about that, Arab terrorism. The Arab-Israeli war commenced. Not, not officially, there wasn't a, you know, a declaration of war, but it immediately through the terrorist acts, these Israelis found they were out on the streets now with their rifles and with whatever, they made hand grenades. That was another thing they had found a spot in, in an orange citrus factory. Behind the citrus cases, they were manufacturing hand grenades and did them by the thousands. So they had hand grenades and rifles with lipstick tube ammunition, and they're out there battling, and this is one of the pictures, the montage of that going on. Now they felt this was a fulfillment of the scripture. The Jewish rabbis believed. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered, 
that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. No one was helping the Israelis at this time. They did it by themselves. And the Israeli strategy, they were completely surrounded by millions of hostile people, and their strategy was attack, attack, attack. <laughs> and so they did. They did not sit there passively waiting for the United Nations to come down and give them a hand. Every effort is being made by the Jews to persuade the Arab populace to stay and carry on with their normal lives, to get their shops and businesses open, and to be assured that their lives and interests will be safe. Now, what we're trying to point out here, as there were 100,000 Arabs living in Palestine, among these Jews that were settling the area, the Jews said, we want happiness and peace and prosperity with you. Don't leave. Stay here. We need you. If you leave, we'll miss the, all the excellent business and services you provide. You're part of our country. Now, understand, they had lived there for generations. These Muslims, these uh, Arabs that were in Palestine. The Arab League, that's the countries around that had Arabs, initiated a cruel and deceptive propaganda campaign against their own people. The Arab governments told us, get out so that we can get in. So we got out. But they did not get in. That's because the Jews were too powerful and didn't let them come in and take over. So here we have this 100,000 Arabs living in Palestine. The Arab League said, get out or we'll kill you, along with the Jews. And so they fled. These are the people fleeing. These are the Arabs fleeing from Israel, from Palestine, going over into the Arab countries with the promise that as soon as they got out, the Arab countries would conquer and destroy the Jews, and then these people could go back and take the Jews' property. That was the promise, because there wouldn't be any Jews left to take it. Those that left were told that they could come back and take all the Jews' possessions. Those that stayed were told they would be killed with the Jews. 1948, Palestinian Arabs fled to Arab countries and set up refugee camps. Now what we hear today, we still hear. I think there are still refugee camps. They, they still say that. And then these, these refugee camps have been there since 1948. Did you ever wonder why there aren't Jewish refugee camps in Israel? You see, a million Jews fled from the Arab countries, and they fled to Israel. Are there any Israeli refugee camps? Never heard of one. That's because as soon as they got to Israel, they were integrated into society and just became other poor Jews struggling to make a living instead of having a special camp out on the edge of town and discriminating against them. These Arabs were put in refugee camps and were not allowed to integrate into the society in the country in which they were living. They were not allowed to have jobs. They were not allowed to, you know, to progress. They were kept as refugees for a political gold mine so that the politics could claim, look at these poor refugees. What you've done to them is heinous. I didn't know how to pronounce that for a long time. Finally, the old English professor got to me. Now, this is a typical official literature story. May the 17th, 2010, the title of the essay is A Young Palestinian Looks Back to 1948. Now, he's only just a young guy. He's less than 30 years old, so he didn't live through it. He was just telling about it. This is what he learned. He's a young school teacher. His name I wouldn't attempt to pronounce. He writes an essay and tells how evil and wicked the Jews were and what cruel things they did to the Arabs and forcing them out of their country. And it's just a, a real propaganda tool. It's the official literature. It's the story that's accepted by the public today. Anyway, I found that interesting as I was reading back and forth the different viewpoints. Cleon Skousen took many tours to Israel and Egypt and surrounding countries. When I met him, he had gone on 26 tours already, and he invited me to join him as a tour guide with him on the 27th tour. One of those tours, I didn't get to Egypt on the tour I went on, but one of those tours was in Egypt, and he tells the story in the book Fantastic Victory. He says, the bus driver said to me, I've got something I want to tell you. 
Now the bus driver's job is to drive the bus, he's not the tour guide. And he says to Cleon Skousen, the Arab tour guides are not telling you the whole story. They're misleading you by what they say about the refugees and the refugee camps. It's not like that. And it was an interesting thing to find out. And that's one of the things that Skousen puts in his book. This bus driver explained. He said, and Skousen says to him, by the way, that's not Skousen, it's just kind of close to him. Skousen says to him, how come you're here driving the bus if they couldn't get jobs? Oh, he says, one day they came into the camp and they says, we need some people to speak English. We're short on bus drivers. Anybody here who speaks English, we'll give you a job. So because he spoke English, he got a job as a bus driver and he got to tell the story to the old professor. The biblical land of Israel, the Jewish and democratic state of Israel, this little tiny red thing out in this huge, massive area. Can you find Jewish Israel surrounded by the Sea of Muslims? Now, these are all Muslim countries here. See the little tiny curve right there? King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Arabs and Jews are cousins. We look with the deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. There is room in Syria for both of us. 1949 to 1967, the armistice lines. The brown area here and here. Let's see, we've got to catch on what we're doing on. The white is, is the, okay, we're back on the, we're still looking at lines that were created by the United Nations and their proposal, and Israel had taken and accepted some of that, and the Arabs refused to accept it. June the 4th, 1967, the leaders of 50 million Arabs in six countries set the goal of getting rid of Israel. Now they're going to do it. They're going to get rid of them. 50 million Arabs. Now here's a couple of quotations. There are a number of others you can read. These are typical. President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. He said on May the 28th, 1967, we intend to open a general assault against Israel. This will be a total war. Our basic aim is the destruction of Israel. Now did he make himself clear? There's no doubt about it. He made himself clear. And I say there are several. Here's a second example of it here. This man, uh, Ahmed, you say it, founder of the PLO. We will wipe Israel off the face of the map, and no Jew will be left alive. Now, did he make himself clear? Now, if you're, if you're a Jew, and you know that that's what their intent is, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit passively by and wait for them to drive you into the sea and kill your family? No, and they didn't either. Here's a famous, two famous leaders of uh, the Israelis at that time, Moshe Dayan and Levi Eshkol. And in conversation, they agreed, if there must be a war, and it was obvious there was going to be a war, if there must be a war, we will decide the time and place where the war will be fought. Now, this is the Six-Day War. And if you haven't ever read the book, it's worth getting on Amazon.com, get a used copy, and uh, you can get that for three or four dollars or five. <laughs> read it. The Six-Day War. We do not want the soldiers of any other country getting killed here in order to secure our safety. I, I enjoyed reading that part of Moshe Dayan. He was a famous character. Now, to show you how ineffective and useless the United Nations is, they had troops, peacekeeping troops, in that part of the country, and they made several agreements on what they ought to do, and they decided to bring all of the peacekeeping troops out of the area. This, this is how effective they were at keeping the peace. As soon as the 50 million Arabs said, we're going to take over and destroy Israel, they pulled all the peacekeeping forces out and gave no support whatever to the people in Israel. Now, it was, it was likened in one of the articles to David and Goliath. David was a little Jewish boy. And the, the, the Goliath was the great symbol of this massive empire of, of military might. And what happened? You know the story, don't you? But the secret was speed, simplicity, surprise, and an air assault. That's what did it for them, the air assault. And so instead of a sling, they used airplanes. Two days into the war, started on June the 4th. Now, two days into the war, the United Nations Security Council meets Oh my goodness, what do we do? What do we do? Only two days into the war, and it was obvious Israel had won in two days. You know, they, they did little tricks like early in the morning before daylight, they bombed all the boats out in the harbors that were going to do not nasty things. 
with their you know frogmen type guys. And then they got all the airplanes in Israel to fly up in the air just off the ground and fly over to the airports of the enemy not too far away. And just before they got there, they came up into the radar zone and all the enemy ran out, jumped in the airplanes and started their engines. And then the Israelis pulled the trigger on their heat-seeking missiles. And all the heat-seeking missiles went down and flew up the tailpipes of all the jets sitting on the runways getting ready to take off. This happened. And so in minutes, they destroyed hundreds and hundreds of aircraft. They wiped out almost all the aircraft of the enemy in the first two days. So here at the United Nations, what are they doing? Well, Mr. Nikoli Fedorovkifred, or whatever his name is, of the Soviet Union, he starts spouting off. He says, cease fire, cease fire. Israel must withdraw to her original lines. His speech lasted six hours. He held the floor for six hours demanding a ceasefire that Israel... Can you imagine how a guy could react for that long? And they let him? Kept demanding. But meanwhile, Israel is wiping them out. And they're getting continuous feedback at the United Nations, and he knows what's happening. And finally he realizes it's not going to be. It's useless claiming a ceasefire and withdraw to your original lines. Then Abba Eben takes the floor. Now, these are fascinating characters. Abba Eben, Google him up. You can watch him speak. You can watch his interviews. He has a wonderful English accent. <laughs> and you'd, you'd think, this is a Jew? He, Oxford English is what they say he speaks. Perfect Oxford English. And I just fell in love with Abba Eben, listening to his reasoning and, and his expressions of the country's you know, situation. And I thought, this guy's telling the truth. I really don't know if he was, but I think he was. <laughs> anyway, Abba even says, who now, who now closes, okay, who now closes an international waterway to the port of a neighboring state? Now, everybody knew that the Arab countries had closed the international waterway and would not allow Egypt, Israel to use it. That's an act of war. He says, who now closes an international waterway to the, to the port of a neighboring state? Who was it that attempted to destroy a neighboring state in 1948? Israel or its neighbors? Did troops of Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, Kuwait, and Algeria surround Israel in this menacing confrontation? Now, everybody knew the answers to these questions. Let us build a new system of relationships from the wreckage of the old. Recognize Israel as a sovereign political entity. This is the position Abba even took on June the 6th, and they had a position of strength already because they had already basically won the war. Oh, but there was one country they didn't think they had, and so they had to whip one more group into shape. I must insert this bit of interesting information. This is the Mediterranean Sea, the black area. 13 miles off, there was a, a ship, an American ship called the Liberty, the USS Liberty. I've often wondered what is the truth about the USS Liberty? What really happened there? And I started to read. Now I'm going to give you a five minute presentation on the USS Liberty. But I thought about it a few days ago and I thought, you know, I've studied at least 20 hours on this subject and I'm going to give you five minutes. 20 hours on the USS Liberty. Again, there's a vast disagreement, contradictory statements, hordes of information on it. It was a spy ship, there's no doubt about that. It was a United States spy ship capable of listening to any signals that were in the air. Now, were they friends or enemies of Israel? Well, we were supposed to be Israel's friend at that time. Why then did the Israelis send up fighter aircraft and torpedo boats and strafe, bomb, napalm, and torpedo the USS Liberty? Why did they do that? That's what I wanted to find out. And I read and I read and I read. June the 8th, 1967, Israeli aircraft strafe and napalm bomb this spy ship. They kill 35, 34 or 35 sailors. They injure 171 more. They just about injure everybody on board. It's a mess. The ship's about ready to sink. And Israel was doing it. This is the, 
The USS Liberty, that, that's the torpedo hole that's set at 30 feet in diameter. This is after the boat came into dock to be repaired, or they finally junked it. The 30 foot diameter hole shot right there below the water line. It's taking water in, it's listing, it's ready to sink. Why was Israel doing this? Dean Rusk, Secretary of State, in his memoirs years later wrote, Israel's sustained attack to disable and sink liberty precluded an assault by accident or some trigger-happy local commander. I didn't believe them then, and I don't believe them to this day. The attack was outrageous. Well, it was outrageous. And he thought it was some kind of a conspiracy by Israel or a conspiracy by Lyndon Johnson. See, so one, one of the theories is that Lyndon Johnson asked the Israelis to go in, un, in unmarked aircraft and destroy the li liberty. This is one of the, the uh, theories. And Lyndon Johnson wanted that to happen so that the Egyptian, so that they could then declare war on Egypt. Well, I read that and I thought, well, okay, let's put that one here to the side and think about it. Another one was the Israelis were going to destroy it because they, the spy ship was getting information and passing it on to the United Nations who would pass it on to the enemy. And so Israel decided to stop the spy ship from passing on information. That was another scenario. Do you believe that one? No, you just set them aside. You don't believe any of them. You just say, that was interesting, that was interesting, that was interesting. And finally, I got down to one that caught my interest, and I thought, you know, that makes the most sense. I still don't know which one's true. Abby Eben. American leaders, including Secretary of State Rusk, found it difficult to assume that the attack had been inadvertent. They occupied their minds with various scenarios of motivation. All of them were false. I categorically assert that the Liberty tragedy was not deliberate. You know, after 19 hours and 40 minutes, I'm serious, it was the last 20 minutes that Sparks started to pull it together. And I finally, you know, I, 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 was, I was all for accepting the Lyndon Johnson scenario. That snake in the grass, that worthless bum, I would love to have blamed it on Lyndon Johnson, but I don't think he did it. I think Abby Eben is probably closest to the truth. Google this. Go home. Have, do your own homework. You're going to see this documentary. It's a, it's a DVD type, you know, it's a, what do they call it, YouTube. It's quite long. It's done by the survivors of the USS Liberty. They are the ones that are in charge of dead in the water. You will get their viewpoint. Watch that one. And then try this one out. Oh, this isn't a, a, a video, this is a read. The USS Liberty, case closed by Michael Oren. Try those, that was the last 20 minutes right there. It was Michael Oren that I think was closer to the truth in the story of the USS Liberty. I gave him five stars, by the way. I put those five stars on that. As I read books and I get done reading, uh, Carolyn and Gary Alder's book is a five-star book. Precious piece of, of homework. Uh, so I gave the, the Oren article five stars. I thought, that guy's worked hard to pull together factual information. He's done a good presentation. This one will give you a good review of what many people think, and, and they're two contrasting viewpoints. This article, this, this is a, D, a DVD, you know, it's, it's a oh, 30 or 40 minute long video. Uh, well done. And, and the other one is a read. Well done. But you'll get the chance then to compare viewpoints. Now, here's another thing, the strategy of the Israelis. When you're surrounded, what are you supposed to do? Attack! Attack, attack! And so hundreds of Soviet tanks start rolling into Israel. And they're going to come in and just blow them out of the water. Huge modern tanks. And the Israelis go, eh, boom! And they blow up the first tank in the line. And now it's roaring in flames and napalm scattered dead everything, ruined the tanks. And these guys in these other tanks, they're looking out their peepholes and they see what just happened. And it says they slammed on the brakes, they jumped out, kicked off their shoes and ran for it. They ran into the desert barefoot and thousands of them died. 35,000 was the total death of the Arabs and many of them from this mistake they made. 
They were fearful their tank was going to get blown up with napalm. But that wasn't the idea at all. As soon as the first tank was blown up and everybody jumped out and ran for it, the Israelis ran out with a bucket of white paint, a, st a stencil, and they'd slam the stencil on the side of the tank and smear the paint on, jump inside and turn it around and start shooting at the Arabs. This went on and they captured hundreds of Arab tanks made in the Soviet Union. And the next war, they said they still had 200 usable tanks ready for use from this conflict. That was a bit of interesting history. Like David and Goliath, David is now the victor. Goliath is laying on the ground, ready to have his head lopped off. David did not lop off his head. He did in the old story, but Israel today did not. But they, they had a fantastic victory. It took six days, June 4 to June 10. Now, June the 10th, 1967, Israel, after the Six-Day War, all the white area, and the blue area, all of that now is Israel. They just whooped them and took it. What are the rules of war when an aggressor comes in and tries to kill you? What are the rules? And you stop the aggressor, and you take over the land the aggressor was... What are, who owns the land now? The victor? Oh, really? You're going to think the victor gets the land? Oh, they've done that for thousands of years, haven't they? That's how the Turkish Empire took the land away from the people before them. June the 10th, Israel after the Six-Day War. They doubled their population. They quadrupled their territory from 8,000 to 34,000 square miles. Jerusalem was back in the Jewish hands for the first time since the days of Rome. The Arab deaths, 35,000. Israeli deaths, 679. It was not a day of celebration and jubilation, jubilee. It wasn't a day where they, you saw like when they took, they, the, 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 the rebels took over uh, Libya recently and they were out shooting their guns and screaming and shouting and killing their leader and all. It was not that in Israel. It was a day of mourning, it says in the reading. A day of mourning. All of the people died Thousands of Arabs, hundreds of Jews. We are the victors. Let us mourn the loss of the dead. A message to the Arab leaders after Israel's fantastic victory from Premier Levi Eshkol. Israel fought only because you left us no choice. Reflect on your losses, which Israel deeply regrets. On the money wasted, which could have gone to the constructive development of your countries had these vast sums, $10 billion, been applied to economic and social needs, millions of human beings who are steeped in poverty could by today have enjoyed an appropriate standard of living. In 1946, in 1946, these little white areas were the areas held by the Jews. In 1947, these white areas were held by the Jews. 1949 to 67, a little bit of change. And today, over here. Now, we've got a pre-1967 map right here. Now, this, this is part of today's news, okay? In pre-1967, these green areas belonged to the Arabs. U.S. President Barack Obama Thursday called for a Palestinian state based on the pre-1967 Israeli borders. We want you to go back to what you had right here. Why did Mr. Netanyahu, is that his name, the prime minister today, why did he say that was a nonsensical idea? Because it is. Do you remember what this man was calling for? Cease fire, cease fire. Israel should withdraw to its pre-1967 borders. That's what the Soviet socialist leader wanted them to do on June the 6th of the Six-Day War. August the 2nd, 2011, Ben Netanyahu, Israel agrees to negotiate over pre-67 lines. He's just going to agree to talk about it. We are willing in a framework of restarting the peace talks to accept a proposal that would contain elements that would be difficult for Israel and we would find very difficult to endorse. Now, that was a few weeks ago. 
I have a hard time keeping current. I tried to find the latest feelings about it. Anybody got a report on what's happening right now today? I don't know, but it changes as the days go by, the situation. Israel will occupy the land that God promised to the posterity of Abraham. Now we're to the future. That's, that's the end of the present. Now we're to the future. Israel will occupy. That's a positive, permanent statement. They will occupy the land that God promised to the posterity of Abraham. It will happen. Israel will become a spiritual center for the millennial era. The temple of Israel will be built on the temple plaza in old Jerusalem. It will happen. Armageddon will come along with the coming of the Messiah. How much territory will Israel ultimately occupy? Well, Skousen puts in his book, Fantastic Victory, this sketch here. Two or three other Bible scholars from different religions put their sketches down. There's no exacting border that anybody knows. We just know it's somewhere out in here, the land of Canaan, that became known as Palestine, now we now call it Israel, is in this area right here. How much territory will Israel ultimately occupy? In the, in the Old Testament we read, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness. The scepter of Egypt shall depart away. The pride of Assyria, that's our, our, Iraq, the pride of Assyria shall be brought down. Now, these are not very positive statements if you're living as an Arab in Egypt or in Iraq. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. See, I read these, and I think, this is pretty grim. But I remember another grim time. God promised he was going to destroy Nineveh. Remember that story? And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And he says, go to Nineveh and preach to them. Oh, but God, Nineveh is so wicked. They kill me and, and they won't repent. I know they won't. I, I'm just going to get on a ship and head for Tarshish. He went to Nineveh. You know the story. And what did Nineveh do? They repented. And so I read these scriptures and I think, is it possible? Could God send a Jonah to Egypt or to Iraq and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and bring them to repentance? Is it possible? Who would ever imagine we'd have missionaries in Mongolia or Romania or Russia teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and baptizing people? Wow, that potential's there. Will God send a Jonah to the Arabs? In Isaiah chapter 19 we read, now this is a prophecy of our time, the future time. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan. So that means five cities in Egypt are going to be fluent in Hebrew. Really, that's what it sounds like to me. And swear to the Lord of hosts. That's to the true and living God, not to, to the Muslim God. So there's going to be some kind of influence, it sounds like, going on with the real true and living God down in Egypt. Then it goes on. In that day, shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a, pillar of, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. One Bible scholar, he says an altar to the Lord is a temple. Are they going to have a temple in Egypt? Well, I'll just put one in there. <laughs> and they're going to have a signpost out on the border that says how many miles to the temple. That's what it says right here. And a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. Or something like that. It's fun to try and understand what this means. I don't know what it means. I just read and I try to grasp what's the God trying to tell us here. Israel will become a spiritual center for the millennial era in the latter days. Ezekiel, I will, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them, and the waste shall be builded. Now, this is a great promise for the future for Israel. Or is it Israel now, as they progress and develop and come closer to fulfillment of this prophecy? I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries, all those names of different Jews from all around the world, and will bring you into your own land, 
and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. They haven't, done, they haven't quite done that yet. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. That will happen. Well, here, we got a kibbutz out in the desert. This is a spot, of, this, this is greenery. This is lush agricultural greenery in the middle of a wasteland. And the waste shall be builded, the scripture says. And here's inside of one of the greenhouses, filled with lush agriculture, producing all manner of good food. And they're doing it with wastewater. And the waste shall be builded. And here we have wastewater agriculture. That's what the Jews call it today. This is wastewater agriculture. And they take the wastewater from their living situation, and they put it through drip irrigation, some of the drip lines are underground. The water never sees the, the light of day and goes out and feeds the roots of their citrus groves and their other forest of you know, useful plants. This is Israel today, and the waste shall be builded. Stand with Israel. What does that mean? Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. That's what came to my mind at this point. Brian, after I'd spent these days and days reading and, and been stimulated by the, the article that you wrote on stand with Israel, you know, what does stand with Israel mean? I thought, this comes to mind. Thomas Jefferson, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with Israel, but no entangling alliances. Whatsoever is more or less than the constitutional law of the land cometh of evil. If the United States government does not follow the Constitution in dealing with Israel, and that allows for no foreign aid, no guns, no ammunition, we cannot send that through our constitutional procedure. It is unconstitutional. If we do that, it will cause more damage than it does good. That's what that scripture says to me. Remember, nothing in the Constitution nor in logic grants to the President of the United States or to Congress the power to influence the political life of other countries, to uplift their cultures, to bolster their economies, to feed their peoples, or even to defend them against their enemies. The proper function of government must be limited to a defensive role. I believe that position is the position God wants us to accept and support. Teach ye diligently things which must shortly come to pass, that ye may be prepared in all things. That's why we're here tonight. We're trying to understand, we're trying to understand so that we can be prepared in all things. David, the branch, will be raised up in the latter days. David has a specific role to fulfill. Now, this, is the, this is the prophecy telling us what's going to happen to Israel. David will have a duty to perform. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Whoa. David's going to be there. He's going to be a leader in Israel. He's going to supervise the construction of the temple. And, and we ask the old rabbi, what was his answer? How is that going to happen? That's God's problem. David will be working through the inspiration of God. And through whatever God directs him to do, they will build the temple where the Dome of the Rock sits today. If the, ge you know, the geography is really correct, I think it is. It appears David will still be in charge of affairs until Jesus returns following the great battle of Armageddon. Now these are the scriptures that support these, these concepts. The temple of Israel will be built on the temple plaza in old Jerusalem. And it's very simple. It's like this. Don't we wish it was that easy? <laughs> Armageddon will come. Ezekiel. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, to take a spoil and to take a prey. It shall be in the latter days. So as Israel builds up its agriculture and they build up their prosperity and they build up their land, become a prosperous country, huge armies will look at them with greed and lust 
and Gog and Magog will organize their forces and come down upon Israel. I believe it says every country in the world will participate. I wonder if our United States will be on the wrong side at that time. In any event, Israel is going to suffer from the encroachment of foreign armies, vast foreign armies. Two prophets will be raised up, and it sounds like they will be there at the same time David is there, David the branch, and these two prophets will be given power to protect Jerusalem for three and a half years, and they will stop the armies of Gog and Magog from encroaching and destroying the city. At the end of three and a half years, God will allow them to be killed. How long will they lay in the streets? Three days. And then this marvelous experience will take place. There will be a great earthquake. And the Mount of Olives will split in two. A valley will form. And the prophets have been killed. And the armies of Gog and Magog are rushing into the city now with power and destruction. And the Israelis will flee into the valley. And then the great Messiah will appear. This is the Messiah they've been looking for. This is the God that they have been looking for that will come with power. And he will defend his, his cherished children. Coming of the Messiah. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And one shall say unto me, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then I shall answer, those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. This will all take place. The Jews will realize that the humble son of the carpenter, even Jesus Christ, is the long-awaited Messiah. And the city of Jerusalem will get a new name. It will be called Jehovah Shammah, meaning the Lord is there. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. And Zechariah's <laughs> prophecies will be fulfilled where he declared, Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This will happen. So it is written, so it shall be. Who's this Jew? His name, when he was born, he was named Israel. His name was Israel Berlin. There have been many Jews make wonderful contributions clear around the world. Many, many Jews. This is just one of them. You all know this guy. Who is it? Irving Berlin. <laughs> he was born to a father named Moses. He was born to a mother named Leah. Different mothers' names are given. Some, some don't say Leah. They have other names. But it appears that Moses and Leah. Does that sound like good Jewish terminology? My mother's name was Leah. My father's name was Moses. And my name is Israel. <laughs> when he was five years old, they fled from the Russian pogroms and came to the United States. And Israel Berlin is one example of a great Jew participating in a great country. What was one of the things you remember he did? Oh, the, lots and lots. Hundred, thousand, I think. Oh, got more than a thousand songs that he wrote. Here's one that we remember. Let's stand and see if we can sing a line of it. Do it. Let's stand up. We're done. That's the end of the program. This, this beautiful song is a good way to close the evening. Do you have a closing prayer for us tonight? Or across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her 
and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Please remain standing for the benediction.